So if we could start with your full name, please. My name is Robert Lawrence Hecker, and I was born in Provo, Utah. And before I was one year old, the family moved to California, so I really consider myself a native of California more than of Utah. Um, What's your birthday, yeah. sir? May 26th, 1922. So how old are you currently? I'm 95 now. I'll be 96 in May. All right. And, and which branch of the armed services did I you I was say? in the Air Force. Well, in those days, it was the Air Corps. And what years did you serve? Well, I served from 1943 until 40, 46. And then I, then I, that was right at the height of the war and I was flying um, and took my training here in the United States and then flew 30 missions over Germany in World War II and, uh, until I left just before the end of the war and came back here and was training to go to uh, the Pacific to fight a against the Japanese when the war ended there. Mm -hmm. And then I came, the, I came out of the Air Force then, but I stayed in the reserve for more than 30 years. Now let me ask you, what did you do for the Air Corps in World War II? Well, I was a bombardier. What happened is I started pilot training, and but they had enough pilots. And they said, they don't need pilots, but you can be a bombardier or a navigator. And I said, I'd like to be a bombardier because a bombardier also had to be a navigator. So uh, that's what I did during the war. I was on a B-17 flying as the lead bombardier, first for the squadron lead, and then eventually I wound up as the group lead for 36 airplanes on a bombing bun, and this was flying out of England uh, over Germany and uh, flew all my 30 missions uh, over Germany. Do you remember what bomb group you were with? Um, yeah, the 401st Bomb Group. And which squadron? And 615th, 615th Squadron, 401st Bomb Group, uh, stationed in a place called Deanthorpe in the center part of England. And what was, what was the highest rank that you attained? Uh, first lieutenant when I got out. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed in the reserve, as I had mentioned, and worked my way up to a lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. when I finally retired from the reserve. And did you receive any medals or commendations during? Oh, yes, I have um, five air medals, the Distinguished Flying Cross. Um, I have... Um, Silver Star. Oh, and then recently the nation of France gave all the World War II veterans their uh, this their Medal of Honor, and I received the France's Medal of Honor. Wonderful. Now I'd like to talk about your childhood, growing up, your your family, your parents, your siblings. Well, it was kind of tough because it was right in the middle of the Depression. And we lived in Long Beach, and my father was a truck driver there. The one thing that helped us a lot was our church. We were all good Mormons and grew up in the Mormon church, and they helped out a uh, number of people who needed help. But it came a time when my father could no longer get uh, work even in Long Beach, and so we moved back to where in Utah, where he had relatives there. We lived there for about a year, and uh, at that time I was in like the fifth or sixth grade. And then we moved to uh, Idaho, near uh, outside of Idaho Falls in a farming community because he had relatives living there who would give him work in, on the farms there. But we lived in a little two-room shack with, with no um, heating in it except for the stove. And I remember my brother and my, my brother is one year older, or two years older than I am. Then he and I had to live outdoors in a tent because we had no room in the, in the, in the house, which was fine in the spring and in the fall, but in the summer, it was awfully hot in that tent. And in the winter, I mean, you put on those clothes from after sleeping out in the snow in the winter, you know, oh, that got to be a pretty, pretty tough. So I was glad when we finally moved back to Long Beach, and that was when the Depression was finally lifting, and I was in junior high school at that time.
well, what happened, actually my father moved back here first to make place for us, and then we followed and came back a little later. And so I was in junior high school at that time, which scared the devil out of me because where I had been in school in Idaho, there were only about 10 kids in the whole class. And we moved to this place in, in Long Beach where there were like 2,000 kids in the school and uh, had to get acquainted with that. But then finally got on the high school in Long Beach and I went to Long Beach Polytechnic High School and was on the track team and did some basketball playing and uh, as, as well as on a couple of academic uh, societies there and graduated from high school. But in those days, we had absolutely no money, <laughs> still kind of low. So when my brother graduated ahead of me and I followed him a, a year later, we went right straight to work. I worked for an aircraft company. I think I went to work for Lockheed. Was that your first job or did that you was, have that any was other? My, that, that was my first job out of there, but I had taken forging and welding class in high school. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and so I was able to get to uh, work for Lockheed, and that was the war in Europe at that time was just starting, and so they were had um, a lot of uh, bombers they were making for for the English at that time. This was before so our the U.S. Was, got that's got right. Involved. This was back in the nineteen thirties or something. Uh, 30s, this was the nineteen forty nineteen forty one when I was there. Yeah. So this was the Lend the this Lend Lease before, Agreement before, with... before World War II, before uh, uh, before December seventh, nineteen forty one. So I was working for Lockheed at the time, and um, then I tried to join the Air Force, and they said, "Well, you don't have enough at that time." They said you have to have two years of college. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any college. I went right to work out of high school. So what I did, I switched to. Uh, uh, the graveyard shift, and I could go to work at midnight and work until uh, morning, seven o'clock in the morning. And then I signed up to a, a Long Beach Junior College and went to college during the day, and would come home and take a nap and then go back to work at night and then go to school the next day. And I did that for about uh, a year and a half until the Air Force lowered the requirements and I was able to enlist in the Air Force. Why did you want to join the, the Air Force? Oh, I always enjoyed aviation and flying. I never had flown, but I, we were we lived not too far from Long Beach uh, Airport, and I loved to go over to the airport and watch the airplanes, and so it would just seemed natural for me to join the Air Corps uh, at that time. Um, then you... what happened, I was taking pilot training, but they said, we've got enough pilots you can be a uh, navigator or a bombardier, so I chose bombardier. Let me ask you, you wanted to join the Air Force before the U.S. was even involved in, in the war? Well, they were just getting started. World War, uh, December 7th had happened. Okay, so let's and, talk about that day. Okay, and I was working, Where were for, you? I was working for Lockheed at the time when uh, on December 7th when that happened. So I went down and tried to join at that time, and they said, you have to have two years of college. That's just when I had to explain it going in there. Were you at so, work when you, you found out? I was, no, it was on a Sunday, and I was in church. Okay. And um, we found out about it. And it, How did you it, find out? Well, I don't remember. It was just, I remember at church, somebody had heard it over the, heard it over the radio, and the, the, the rumor went around at church that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. So what did you so, think when you, you so I So I, with a lot of the other guys, we, we were all gung-ho to go down and enlist. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanted the Air Corps. And so, but I had to have those two years of college, so I went back to work and worked and went to college at the same time. But then they lowered the requirements, so I was able to get back in. And I was taking pilot training, but um, they said they've got enough pilots. We need bombardiers and navigators, so I became a bombardier. And I uh, flew 30 missions um, out of Germany, out of England, over Germany, and uh, yeah. I wound up as the group uh, bombardier. So let me ask you, as you were working at Lockheed, you. You were aware that 
this war in Europe was, was oh, yes, going yes, on. Oh, yes, yes, that was like, did was you... going on. I, was, uh, I remember I was a Boy Scout at the time, too. And I remember one time we took a uh, trip going up to, uh, I had one of the Boy Scout things, I had one trip with the Boy Scouts to go up to uh, Canada. So we took the trip up to Canada, but this was in 19... 39 or 1940 before World War II, the uh, United States was in, but England was fighting at that time. Yeah. And up in Canada, they were all recruiting and getting everything for the war because it uh, was going on at the time. So I was still in high school. And uh, so when I got out of high school, and that was when, World, when we got involved in the war. Did you think that that we eventually would at that time? Did you have an idea or, or oh, thoughts? Oh yeah, that we everybody would everybody was quite sure we would get into it. We just didn't know when. Yeah. Uh, and so when when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, that was a big shock and a big surprise. But not because we were getting into the war. It was a shock and a surprise because they had done that. Um, but I think we would have been drawn into the war eventually, one way or the other, because yeah. it was dragging on and on, and England was in bad shape at that time, and they really needed some help. And at that time also, the Japanese were moving all over the South Pacific, yeah. and a lot of the American uh, uh, companies were down there, and a lot of the, we, had, we were involved in the Solomon Islands and that sort of thing long before that. So when the Japanese came in, it seemed like only a matter of time until we had to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really surprised. And uh, but I was all tried to join up a couple of times before I actually got that taken in, but uh, they didn't want me <laughs> until I had that two years of college. But what happened is after we went in it, after I got uh, active duty, they sent us to college for and. Uh, I, they sent us to the different colleges just to get our two years in, but we had to get it in an accelerated time. And they put us in like for six months or eight months or nine months mm -hmm. uh, to cover two years of college. And to my surprise, they put me in the six months group because I figured that I would be up to a lot of the guys at that time had quite a bit of college when they went in. And I had just night school and uh, or the day school in, uh, in Long Beach Poly High School mm -hmm. and also in the, uh, what was the name of the Poly Junior College, mm -hmm. that Polytechnic Junior College. So anyway, they, I went up, they took us to Utah and I went up to Utah and in six months I took two years of college up there and then came back and went through completely through bombardier training and ended up in Europe uh, as a lead bombardier over there. So let's talk about your, your training in the well, States. Well, the training, as I say, it started out with, uh, with um, going to the college up in Utah, and then they came back and sent us to Santa Ana for uh, distribution where we do go for your training. So they sent me to Carlsbad. Well, first I went to Arizona to take pilot training and I was taking pilot training there when they switched me over to Bombardier. Then I went to Carlsbad uh, in New Mexico, which was a Bombardier training place there. And I was there for like, uh, I think it was about eight months. And that included gunnery training because at that time the Bombardier was not only the Bombardier, he was also the gunnery officer, so he had to know all about the gunnery training. And he was also the first aid officer, so he had to know all about first aid. So he had a, I mean, he's also the backup navigator, so we also had to learn navigation. And a lot so of responsibility. They had a lot of responsibilities there. Were you, were you discouraged when you, you learned that you couldn't be a pilot and you had well, to Well, at different... first I was, but then I figured what difference it would make, you know. And I, I also did when we finally, when I finally got with my crew, and we started, we did a lot of training then in Oklahoma with our with our complete crew, before because when they sent us over to England, they sent us over as a crew, yeah. and uh, so we did a final training in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and my pilot let me do a lot of training, a lot of flying with a B-17 at that time, because mm -hmm. he knew I had a little bit of uh, pilot training. So I flew the B-17, and also we flew our own B-17 
from uh, uh, New England up over over to to England and uh, flying from here over to England, uh, my pilot let me do a lot of the flying over the Atlantic Ocean. I think if our crew had known I was doing the pilot <laughs> piloting, they would have had heart attacks. <laughs> but but I was able to do the the, the flying uh, fly for three or four hours of the trip over to uh, to England. And then, um, of course, when I got over there, then they had pilots. I didn't get to do any of that, but I did some of the navigation. Yeah. And um, so I was part time on navigate doing navigation also as well as uh, bombardiering. So uh, then when the war ended and they came back over here, that was when I had an opportunity to go back to college under the GI Bill. Yeah. Now when um, when they formed your crew, can you t tell me about those guys a bit? How how that all came together? And... Yeah, we they were we were all strangers. They were all been taking their their separate training in different places. The pilots had their training in one place, and the navigator had his in a different place, and the bombardier in a different place, and all of the gunners had, most of them had different gunnery schools they had gone to. So we were all strangers, but we all got along together fine, and everybody knew his job and what he had to do, and we just melded together into a crew. And um, you guys pretty close. Once? And we were all well. We were we were close, but not so much so. The the, the what? There were four officers, and the, and the rest of the crew. The gunners were all uh, enlisted personnel, mm -hmm. and then in uh, they kept the officers separate, and they had separate quarters and separate uh, in England. We they had separate quarters for the officers and separate quarters for the enlisted personnel. And we didn't eat together. We didn't uh, uh, go around together. We put the officers pretty much stayed together. And when we got uh, passes from time to time to go into wherever we wanted to go on those passes, we get a three-day pass after so many missions. Uh, the f officers went off together, mm -hmm. and the enlisted guys went off together wherever they wanted to go. So there wasn't that much hobnobbing. We got to be friends because we were all together most of the time. But we never did associate together after when we were not actually uh, flying missions. Uh, but I got to know the, all the various officers and this sort of thing. And when we, when we had uh, three days, we usually went into London. And London was the big place there at that time. And um, we all uh, go to the nightclubs and places like that there. I remember one time, I don't know if you want any of these stories or not, Absolutely. But I remember one time, my rest of my crew, the, the three guys from the crew, they wanted to go out to the nightclubs, but I didn't. I was a good Mormon, and I didn't drink, so I didn't want to go to the nightclubs, so I went to a movie. And when I came out of the movie, um, they had girl usherettes there because all the guys were off. Uh, men in England were off to war somewhere, so they had these girl usher usherettes. And this one beautiful young girl came, my usher came over to me and said, your belt on your, on your coat is all twisted up and back. Um, and I said, would you straighten it out for me? And she says, yeah, okay. So she straightened it out for me. And she said, by the way, my friends and I are having a party after we get, when we get off work. Would you like to come to the party? So I said, okay. And so I waited for them. And when they got off work, she and the other three girls uh, took me to their party. And we went to this party, and there were a whole bunch of English guys there, English officers and people like that. And they didn't like this American coming in one bit. <laughs> but I enjoyed myself, had a nice party there, and but I got all our phone numbers. And every time we had a, um, uh, a pass to go into London, I would pull out my phone numbers, and I would call and see who wasn't working that night and we'd go to a movie or go to dinner somewhere like that and all these other guys on my crew and the rest of them thought where did he get all those phone numbers how does he know all those girls wow <laughs> that's amazing they all want to hang out with you after that <laughs> that's right I had somewhat the same thing happen to me when I came back from uh, when we came back from England and we're getting ready to take training to uh, with the first place they sent us. Everybody from California came back to Santa Ana by train. They put us on a train right from New York. 
and the first place we stopped was at Kansas City, Kansas, and we got there late afternoon, and we had like a four-hour layover. So I was by that time I knew three or four of the guys that were on the same car that I was on, and one of them said, "I used to live in Kansas City. I know a place down here, a real nice." club and he said we can go down there and have something to eat while we're waiting for the train okay so the four of us started going down there the five of us i remember and we started walking down there and in front of us were five girls were walking along so one of the guys said hey let's get acquainted with those girls we'll invite them to go to the club with us i said you can't pick them up in the middle of the street like that they said yes we can i said well there are four of them and four of you you guys guys go ahead so they did they ran up and i saw them talking to these girls and the girls brushed them off <laughs> and the guys finally turned off and went down a side street so I thought, oh, I've got to catch them because I don't know where this club is. So I ran up to catch them and I said, Pastor Girls, I said, which way did those guys go? They said, they went down that street. Why? And I said, well, we're going to a club over here and I don't know where it is. I've got to find them. And they said, what's the club? So I told them the name of the club, which I can't remember now. But they said, that's where we're going. Why don't you come with us? So I said, okay. And <laughs> so I went with them. And when I walked into the club, with the four girls, these guys were already in there and their eyes got big. <laughs> and they thought, what the heck is this? How did they do that? So they came over and they tried to join our table and the guy, the girls said, get away from us, we're with him. And they bought me food, they bought me drinks, they bought everything you know, for me there. And when it came time to go to the train, they walked me with the train. And some guys waiting for the train to, to leave were we in the station. Some of them hadn't been, met one girl, some of them met two, but I was the only one with four. <laughs> <laughs> and, Pretty good luck. And all the way to California, everybody's talking about me. Look at that guy, he got four girls in, <laughs> in Kansas City, you know. And I thought, well, when you've got it, you've got it, you know. <laughs> but anyway, well, yeah. let me ask you, when you're training as a bombardier, yes. what, what, is, what does that all involve? Well, Are you actually in no, what, planes? What, what, what would happen on a bomb run, the, the navigator would navigate you to a particular place called an initial, what we call the initial point, which was near your target. For example, you were going to bomb the airports and in Berlin which were one of the toughest targets there because they had over a thousand flat guns there shooting at you at the same time. Um, so they would pick out a place about 30 miles from, from the target and that was called the initial point. And at that point, the, plane that, the pilot turned the plane over to the bombardier and the bombardier was hooked up to the autopilot. So the bombardier was actually flying the airplane. Now the pilot kept the speed and the altitude and they had to keep it very precise because if you're off even 50 feet in altitude, your bomb from 26, 27,000 feet could miss by several hundred feet. So the pilot had to be careful of the speed and altitude, but the bombardier was actually flying the plane for the course, left or right. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and he was using the bomb site to zero in on the target, and he would turn the knobs on the bomb site to control the plane to keep those uh, the crosshairs on the target. Mm -hmm. And the target, the bomb at the site had a, some indices on it. And as you're moving, those indices would would be traveling. And as they came together, and the minute they came together, that's when the bombs would automatically drop. Mm -hmm. So you had your target, your crosshairs on the target, you had them there and you had to hold them there and hold them there and hold them there as you're flying this plane and everything and the indices came together, your bombs would go out. Mm -hmm. And the minute the bombs were out, the pilots would close the bomb bay doors or, or the bombardier would, and then the pilot would take over the plane and by that time you were in the middle of this big field of flak, which was sometimes so big, several hundred yards, well, a couple of miles wide, just loaded with these guns firing at all the planes because you had to be at a certain place at a certain altitude that the bomb the gunners on the ground knew and they were aiming their shots all up and so it was like a big box we were flying into of nothing but flak 
and the plane was getting bombarded by this. So the minute your bombs were gone, the pilot would take over the plane and zoom out of there as fast as he could. And all the other planes in the group, 36 planes in the group, well, keep their formation and all fly out of there mm -hmm. and um, then fly back to England. And the, the guys that got shot down, um, you'd see planes exploding in the air around you and, get, and some of them would just be in tail spins or whatever. But if they got the bail out, then of course, if they ever hit the ground <laughs> still alive, they were prisoners of war for the rest of the war. Yeah. So you always tried, no matter how much you were shot up, you always tried to get back to England as possible because you didn't want to be a prisoner of, a prisoner of war for the rest of the war. Absolutely. So uh, the, the, the bombardier at that time was also the, the first aid officer. And if any of your crew got shot up, you tried, if possible, to take care of them, you know, and keep them alive until you get back to England. But sometimes that was like a, like a four hour or five hours flight back to England again. And so the, unlike on the ground, if a person got shot on the ground, you usually had first aid officers that could be there within, usually within a few minutes. But if you got wounded while they were on an airplane, sometime it was four or five hours before you got back, whether it was a hospital or whether it was really uh, first aid people who could take care of you. In the meantime, it was up to the mom and the ear to try to keep them alive. And sometimes when uh, the temperature up there was like 40, 50 degrees below zero, mm -hmm. and you had no, the only thing you had to keep you warm was your flight suit. And it was an electrically heated flight suit, which would work pretty well, except if the flak had knocked the electricity out on the plane, you had no electricity there, so you had no heating. And at 40, 50 below zero up there, for something like three or four hours before you could get down low enough to get uh, some warm air. Uh, a lot of those guys who were wounded, they, they, they died not so much from the wound, but from the from the temperature. Um, Did you ever experience that on, on any of the missions that you went on? Uh, not not to that extent. We had some of the times we had our flak suit was shot. If, if uh, for example, if you're if a, if a flat came in and hit the suit you were wearing, it might it might knock the, the heat out on an arm or a leg or something like that, but severing the electrical cords and the thing as well as wounding your arm. And then you tried to, if possible, get your flat suit over there and keep them warm as best you could yeah. with, the, with the rest of their suit that was working. Uh, and the same way with oxygen. If they shot out your oxygen, you had to leave the formation and get down because uh, of that all the 26,000 feet up, uh, you could last for maybe four minutes without oxygen. Mm -hmm. And if your oxygen was shot out, we had what they call walk around bottles. And you know, there were bottles that would last for about four or five minutes mm -hmm. that you could plug in. But when that was gone, you had to get down to a lower level. So sometimes a plane would get the oxygen system shot out and would, uh, Lee had to, if you try to finish the bomb run and then get out and you'd have to leave the formation, fly down and get down low, but then you were, you were really a, a, a target for all of the German aircraft tried because you were alone and you didn't have the rest of the group helping mm -hmm. protect you. And they, they got shot up pretty badly if you had to leave the formation. and. So you tried to stay with the formation as much as you could because you get 36 B-17s with each one armed with like 10 machine guns that you can put up a pretty big heavy volume of fire. But if you had to leave the formation for some reason and you became a straggler, <laughs> you, were, you, you were dead meat for those uh, ME-109s and whatever they had, whatever, yeah. Falk Wolfs, whatever they were throwing, and throwing at you. So people tried to stay with the formation as much as possible, uh, at least until you got back over the English Channel where you might be able to drop down out of the formation and get down real low mm -hmm. going over the water. But um, the English Channel, you tried, you tried to make it back to England as possible because the Germans controlled almost all of Europe at that time. They didn't want to be a prisoner of war. And uh, 
but going over the channel and getting back in England sometime was pretty scary itself. Challenge. And if you had a ditch in the channel, uh, your chances of survival were pretty low because those B-17s were not, were not ships that didn't float mm -hmm. <laughs> for very long. And the water at that time was, in the winter time, was very cold, you know, and you couldn't last out there very long. Let me ask you, did your, did your brother serve? In My World brother was in the Navy in, in the Pacific. And so I had no connection with him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, we, just, uh, we didn't even write to each other because I didn't know his address. We were both moving around. <laughs> so uh, Did he leave before you did or did you leave? Yeah, before? well, he was two years older than I am. So he signed up right out of high school and I was still in high school at the time. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and he signed up before the war, actually started before 1941. Mm -hmm. So he was in the Navy at the time it started, so he was in the Pacific uh, most of the time. He was a, a, an electrician uh, in, in the Navy. Mm -hmm. I don't know what ships he was on, but, uh, but you know, he was over there for oh, over three years. Uh, um, are you cold? Are you okay? No, no, not really. Now, when you're going through bombardier training in the States, uh -huh. are you flying in, in B-17s? Are you dropping bombs? What, it, what yeah, does that yeah. entail? Yeah, well, yeah. What, what it was, uh, you, at first you had to go through, through a flight school where they would teach you all about the bomb site and what it looked like and then how to repair it if something went wrong and, and what it did and how bomb sites work and how bombs fall and all those sorts of things, all the mechanics of being a bombardier before you actually got in an airplane and went up. And then they had what they call AT-11s, which were twin engine uh, planes that had a bomb in them and they would put, uh, put like a 10 or 15 100 pound practice bombs in mm -hmm. and this was at Carlsbad um, where our flight our training was and there were several of these schools around the United States but we have to, I happen to be in the one at Carlsbad New Mexico they tried to keep them out in the middle of the desert somewhere so they could have all this flying and not worry about other airplanes uh, so we took our training there, and what happened, you would you'd fly a practice mission with your bomb site and an instructor, and usually there would be three or four bombardiers go on one practice mission, and each one would drop three or four practice bombs using the bomb site and targets on the ground, and 100-pound practice bombs, and then you'd come back. Uh, and until you got proficient at what you were doing and after a certain length of time. And they also had ground trainers in, in the hangar. They had a, a, a big platform on wheels up about 10 feet with a bomb set on it. And they had a place on the ground on the floor marked out as the target. And you could actually like fly a simulated mission with this thing in, the, in the, this hangar. So you got training on the ground and in the air actually flying. Then when we got over to England, one of the first things they did there before you actually flew a mission, they had the bombardiers go up with the, with the group lead bombardier and he would take them on a practice mission. And we would fly up to, uh, and they put about five of the newly arrived bombardiers in the B-17 with the, with the instructor, the, the lead bombardier from the group and fly up to a, a place off of Scotland. Uh, there was a big rock in the, in the water up there that stuck out that we could use as a target. Then we would put practice bombs in and fly up there. And he would have each bombardier drop four or five practice bombs to just see what, how proficient they were. Mm -hmm. And the lead bombardier would, uh, would evaluate them and make sure they were doing okay. I remember flying up there on our mission when the first time I flew up there, we were um, we were flying up and we were uh, setting up the bomb site to fly and something was wrong with the bomb site. And so the lead bombardier said, oh, we're going to have to go back and do this all over again, you know. And, and I thought, <laughs> I looked at the bomb site and I said, why, why don't we just fix it? And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean fix it? It's a bomb site. It's a northern bomb site. Uh, who can fix it? 
I said, well, it looks to me like the link trail arm has come loose, and we can fix that. And the other bombardier looks at me, and he looked at me and said, are you kidding? I said, I mean, you got a pocket knife. So one of them did, and I took the top off the bomb site, put the link trail arm back on, put the bomb site, and I said, now we're okay, we're going to go through with it. And we did the mission. And they thought that was phenomenal. And I said, I thought to myself, where the hell were these guys during class? This was one of the things they taught us was how to fix that. <laughs> these guys are so dumb. <laughs> and including the lead bombardier. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wound up as the lead, as it turned out. Um, but that was just one of the things we had to do. We had to go up there and do a practice mission. Yeah. And then, so when you got flying, but see, what would happen in the group, even with your own bomb site, <laughs> they wanted all these planes to drop their bombs simultaneously because all of them had to hit that target, whatever it was. Um, we didn't, we didn't, aim for, unlike so many of the things, uh, like the Germans just would aim in a city, period, mm -hmm. you know, and even some of the British at the latter part of the war would just throw bombs at the cities, you know, and the heck with it. But in the American bombardiers, we had specific strategic targets we had to hit, and they were usually like airfields, or they were like, um, uh, manufacturing plants for the manufacture of the aircraft or the bombs or the guns or whatever they were using in the war, or there were railroad yards. We had a lot of railroad yards and to keep the troops from going up and relieving the other troops. And um, so there were all, always these strategic targets. And they tried to get all the 36 planes of the group to drop their bombs simultaneously, so, or, Sometimes the mission would break them up into squadrons, each one, but the, the planes of the squadron, but those in the squadron had to all drop their bombs simultaneously because just one bombardier dropping his bomb would not make that much difference. Mm -hmm. But they want to, so you all hit the target or you all miss the target. Mm -hmm. So what happened, the lead bombardier was the one who zeroed down on the target. Now the other bombardiers had their bomb sights in case the lead bombardier got shot down or something happened, they were there so they could take over the lead. And um, so they all used their bomb sights, but they didn't, but what they kept an eye on that lead bomb plane while they were doing it. And when he dropped his bombs, they dropped theirs. Mm -hmm. So everybody had a group of bombs were flying to get, going down together. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the lead bombardier missed, everybody missed. And the mission was a complete walkout, washout. So you tried to pick the best ones you could, the best bombardiers to be the lead bombardier because if he missed, everybody missed. So you want your best guy to take the yeah. lead. Yeah. Later on, they even got to the point where they didn't have actually trained bombardiers on board the planes. They had what they called toggleers. And these guys didn't even have a bomb sight. They just had to be 17, and he would be up there with all the control things for the bomb bay and for all the bombs and uh, getting them ready. Um, and when the lead bombardier, who had the bomb sight, dropped his, they dropped theirs. He missed, everybody missed. So the lead bombardier had to know what he was doing. Yeah. But one of the things you had to do, which was always scary, uh, the bombs, so they wouldn't go off of the plane prematurely, all had, um, uh, what do they call them, the things on them, safeties on them, so they, so the, when they hit the ground, they all had a little propeller on the nose of the bomb, and then when the bomb fell out, they had a, a wire that went down to the pro propeller, and as long as the propeller was on the bomb, it wouldn't explode because uh, the, the bomb uh, safety thing on there would keep them from exploding. So you had to make sure that, that safety, the, all the bombs were safety with a wire going down through there. And then if anything happened to the plane where it got hit to the point where it got knocked all over the place, sometimes those bombs on the rack would, would, wrong, would jiggle around and that wire would be pulled out of there. And if the wire was pulled out and the wind coming through the bomb bay, 
caused the little propeller to spin. The propeller could spin off, and it spun off. That bomb was armed in the bomb bay, and if it hit another bomb, it couldn't explode. And that did happen in some of the planes there. The, the safety wire didn't came loose, and something happened to it, and the, the little propeller flew off. The, the plane got jiggled somehow, and the bomb was hit together, and it exploded and blew a plane up. So he had to be careful. We had uh, something like that happened to us. I remember flying over, flying one time on a mission. We were flying over the English Channel, climbing, and we were one of the that's one of our first missions, and we were one of the low planes in the group. And um, so the uh, prop wash from a group in front of us, from the propellers, blew over to us and hit our plane. And this swirling air from the propellers of the group in front of us took this B-17 and it flipped it over on the back like that, just as fast. And we were up over the English Channel at the time, and we were the low plane in the group, and we were the only ones that hit. We were the low plane, and off we went, and it flipped this over on our back, and we're falling down to the English Channel. And the pilot is trying to get control of the plane and trying to pull putting it back and I was in there getting ready. I thought we gotta bail out because we'll never make it. And I'm trying to get up, but the centrifugal force was such that I couldn't get out of the seat. Nobody could move. We were pinned down. And but the pilot finally got control and brought the thing up again and finally got it back up stable and we started flying up to try to join the group. But I went back to the bomb bay and saw that several of the planes that the, the bombs had been knocked off the racks, and some of them, the safety wires were out, and the little propellers were spinning like crazy. So I was standing in the bomb bay, it has a little place you can stand on, about six inches wide, the length of the bomb bay, and you have to stand on that to get out there. If you, if you fall off, or if you don't stand on that, you go through the bomb bay because those doors wouldn't hold you, and you just fall. So you had to, had to make sure you had one hand holding on, one hand trying to put the, the little propellers back on the bombs and trying to re-safety them. Then I got the radio operator to come in and help me and we're standing out there on that little platform trying to put those bombs back together. Finally got them all safety and everything and went ahead and finished the mission. But uh, that was a, a, about as scary as it gets when I was trying to get out of that seat and it's in centrifugal force could move you. <laughs> I so thought, if I'm going to die of fright, it's going to be now. <laughs> so were you guys completely upside down? Uh, completely upside down, and he had to bring it back back up again, you know. And to do that, he had the full power on two engines off on one side and full power off on the other side, and he had to, it was hitting the, the, the rudder in the back and hitting bang, 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 trying to get that thing pushed up and around and back up right side up and he finally did to find the two pilots finally got it back right side up but by that we, we had fallen about uh, I guess about uh, 15,000 feet by that time and uh, took us the rest of the mission to catch up to the for the rest of the group mm -hmm. and but that was about as scary as anything I was ever in. Did you think you guys were, were gonna crash? Oh yeah, I could see that English Channel coming up at me. I thought we were done, you know. Wow. But uh, no, we made it out of there. We had, we got a uh, prop wash a couple other times in the flight, but not like that. We just, just not to jiggle the plane, but not not enough to minor in yeah, comparison. Right. So let me ask you about your your. Um, when did you guys arrive in England? I, um, well, let's see, I arrived there, uh, we flew our own play plane over there and landed initially in Scotland, and then they took the plane away from us in Scotland, and then we took a train down to um, Deanthorpe, where we, where we were, and this was in uh, mid-1944 for, for me. Uh, I think it was in uh, July of 1944, and then I through most of my mission then from mid-1944 up until I think it was, uh, March, February or March, February of uh, 1945, then the war ended in, in May, in, and by that time I was on the way back here and getting ready to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. You remember your first mission that you flew? 
No, I remember. I remember. I don't remember the details. I remember that it was. Uh, an, uh, it was. A, we were supporting a bunch of ground troops, so we. It was what, what we call a. Uh, a milk run. There were very little flak and very very few fighters because uh, it was we weren't bombing any big strategic place there. We were supporting some ground troops. I remember in um, when they had the Battle of the Bulge, and that was at Christmas time in 1944. Uh, that was when the Germans had broke broken through and were come pouring into France at that time, and we were trying to support them, uh, but the weather was so bad then, we couldn't even get off the ground. It was at Christmas time, when finally, I remember on, on Christmas Day, the uh, day before Christmas, we were able to get our planes up in the air and go out and support the troops, but we couldn't get back to our own base because it was fogged in by that time. I remember landing at some, uh, some British base that was clear on the coast, but they didn't have enough places <laughs> for us to sleep. All these crews all landing at the same time at this one base. I remember Christmas Eve, I slept on a pool table. It was the only place I could <laughs> find to sleep. And then the next morning, we got up at four o'clock in the morning to fly another mission, and off we went to the Battle of the Bulge again. Mm -hmm. And this time, we were able to come back and we had, but still our base was fogged in, so we had to fly all the way down to the to the what they call an England Land's End, which was right down the very southern tip of England. It was uh, there were a couple of bases down there that were open, and we were able to land there. And then the next day we were able to fly back to our own base. But we were gone like for four days, I guess it was, mm -hmm. from our base in uh, on the, during the Battle of the Bulge. And that was one reason why I got this medal from. Uh, uh, France, because everybody who fought in France in World War II were given this medal, and we were in the Battle of the Bulge, so I was included in that group. Now tell me, uh, arriving in, in, in Europe, in, um, is this an exciting time for you? Are you well, what's going through your mind? Uh, yes and no. By this time I've been training for, you know, like almost two years, and it was kind of like more of the same. <laughs> it was different because of a different place and doing different things and everything, but it was like like you go to college, you go to one college, then you go to another college, you go to another college, and they're all colleges and they're things pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. So when you fly a mission, the worst part of the mission, the thing that scared me the most, was not during the actual flight itself over there, over the target, it was on the way. What happened? We would have to get up at four o'clock in the morning for most missions, and it was still dark. And you'd go out, and by the time you finish your briefing and where you're going and who you're gonna be with and all those kind of briefing things, uh, it took about two hours, but still in the winter time, it was still dark when you went out and got in your plane. Then you had to assemble 36 planes up over England and get your group all together, but they'd take off one at a time. So you had to, the lead plane would go up first, and they had what they call a buncher on the ground, which was an electronic, which was a, a, a signal that they would send up. And the navigator and the plane would get this signal, and he would navigate the plane so you'd fly in a big circle like this around that spot on the ground where, where you were, uh, your group was assembled over. And then the next plane would take off, and they and they find that first plane and fall in position on the side of him, where you had to be in position. And then the two of them would go around and around. And then their third plane would take off, and he would go around and join them and go around. And and pretty soon he had thirty six planes, going around and around like this. But. Over here, about five miles, was another group with 36 planes going around and around. And over here was another group with 36 planes going around and around in the dark with no lights. And sometimes, as long as you stayed within that place where you were supposed to, you were pretty safe. Uh, you could see the other planes next to you, the big shadows of the other planes. And um, uh, the tail gunner and someone would, would be signaling a little little light so you could spot the, the plane. But 
if the wind blew you off of your course a little bit and your navigator didn't catch it, you could be coming down this way at the time and blow you over to this group who was at that time coming up this way. Mm -hmm. And the two groups would go through each other. And sometimes you had collisions up there in the dark in the middle of the night and all of a sudden there was this big explosion and you knew what had happened. So those two of the planes that were assembling had gone together and exploded. And um, to me that was the scariest part of the whole mission. Mm -hmm. The flak was scary, but it was something you expected, you know. And um, uh, being shot out by uh, German fighters, this sort of thing was kind of part of the things you, was, you, you knew would be happening. But that assembly in the dark, with all those planes, and sometimes over a thousand planes are assembling over England at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, that was really scary. And what about the, the first time you experienced flak and, and being shot at by the enemy? Well, uh, it, 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 it's bad, but it isn't, as long as you're not hit, it doesn't bother you that much. I mean, you could, you could look out the planes and you could see these flak bursts all around you, because when a shell explodes, it's like, but it's like an artillery barrage is what it is. But instead of shooting on the ground, uh, they're like 200 ground, if on the ground, if you have like 50 cannons shooting a barrage, and those 50 shells are shooting all in one area, you know, that's a scary thing. But suppose you're up there and there are a thousand guns firing at you, and they're shooting it in this big box, and you see this blackness with the shoulder exploding, and here you come, and you have to fly into it. Then you have to fly through it. And you can hear sometimes the, the, the flak hitting the plane, like like uh, somebody's throwing a handful of rocks at it, <laughs> you know, and then pulling little holes because of that flak. Sometimes it's just it's fairly big, or it can be like this, uh, like a like a bullet. You know, the different sizes, the way the thing explodes, and you got all these flinging, uh, planes flying at you. That was, that was scary, but, but it was something you expected. Mm -hmm. You knew it was going to be there, and you knew it was going to be like that, and you had sort of mentally prepared yourself for that sort of thing. It was uh, unexpected things like these bombs blowing up, or the planes blowing up when you're assembling, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. Or like, well, they got plane got flipped over by a uh, prop wash. And those were scary things because you couldn't prepare yourself for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, the rest of the time, uh, soldiers in battle kind of prepare themselves for the things that might happen to them. So when they actually do happen to you, it isn't that much of a shock. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of which, you mentioned earlier you were telling me about the instance where you, you got hit by a piece of flak. Yes. Can you tell me about that instance and what the mission was? And Well, I don't remember which mission it was. Um, we, got, we got shot up with flak on most missions, uh, and I don't remember exactly which mission it was or where it was. Oh, I remember we were actually getting hit, and being hit so hard with this piece of flak that it drove me forward and hit my head up against the, the bomb site and uh, knocked me out for a, but only for a couple of seconds. So I was able to get back and do my work again. But uh, I don't remember which mission it was or where it was. Um, one of the worst ones we had was an oil refinery in it called Merzberg. And they had something like 1,500 flat guns surrounding it. So that when you went in, all 15 couldn't bring them, uh, 1,500 couldn't bring them to bear on you, but wherever you went, you had something between 500 and 1,000 guns shooting at you. You know, and to, you talk about a barrage on the ground when you see these soldiers diving into foxholes to get away from this barrage, but the barrage might be only like 25 or 30 guns. Mm -hmm. But when you have like a thousand of them shooting at you in no foxhole, <laughs> you just mentally prepare yourself for it. I mean, and is there happen. anything you can do to avoid it or evade it? Or? Nothing, because 
as I mentioned, when the bombardier is going, he has to drop his bomb at a, from a certain spot, and that spot can be as, like 50 feet wide, up in the middle of your 26,000 feet up, and you've got to drop it from that particular place to hit that particular place on the ground. Well, those gunners on the ground know <laughs> what that spot is up there too, mm -hmm. because in order for you to hit down there, they know what the wind is and the temperature and all those different things that can affect a bomb. And so they know you've got to drop from over here in order to hit down there. So they're prepared for you. Mm -hmm. So when you come up there and the first group that goes by and drops their bombs, they're already shooting at them and they can adjust their, their uh, shooting then on that first group or the second group or the third group. So by the time the fourth group gets there, you know, they're zeroed in. They've got that spot where you have to be at that particular spot in the air to hit the target on the ground. And they know about what and altitude And they know where it is. And they've got radar down there, they're watching you too. But usually we, we had stuff that we dropped out called chaff, which was, which was pieces of paper, reflective paper, mm -hmm. and we would throw that out of the plane to pick up their radar, and it would kind of dis dissuade their radar, you might say, or screw up their radar so they couldn't follow us too well. Mm -hmm. But they really didn't need that because they knew where you had to be as well as you knew where you had to be, and they're just they're not firing at you; they're firing at a place up there. Where you're going, they know you have to fly through to hit that particular target. So, and you had all these gunners on the ground, and the one good thing about it was each gun on the ground, and there might be a thousand of them down there, had to have a crew of like 20 men mm -hmm. to keep them going. Well, there were 20,000 men that were down there instead of out fighting the other troops somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you were not only fighting this battle up here, you were keeping those guys out of that battle over there. So, so there was more to the bombing than just dropping the bombs on his target. Now was it difficult to concentrate on what you were trying to do as, as you know, the flax hitting the plane and going mm -hmm. off around you? And you, How do you focus? You, you expected that, and it was just like if you were in a classroom, for example, <laughs> and somebody's talking somewhere or doing something, you kind of ignore them. You, you you expect it, and so when it happens, you're prepared for it, and you've already adjusted for it. Mm -hmm. So no, that didn't didn't bother you. You know, you you you're apprehensive. You were apprehensive, but you weren't scared. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Still had a job to do. You know, still had a job to do, and uh, like these guys that build skyscrapers and walk out on these beams and things, and, and the wind is blowing up there. Are prepared, you know, yeah. and so you're prepared for this too. The only uh, so you flew about 30 missions, you said, right? So, 30 missions. What happened? You originally they only had to fly 25 missions, but the the rate of uh, I guess you say getting hit up there at that time was um, it was 10 percent. 10% of a mission almost got shot down almost on every mission. Mm -hmm. Well, when you had like 36 planes, there were three, of four, five planes that got shot down on every mission. Well, not some fights or some groups had nobody shot down, which means to keep the percent for the percentage that flew up. This group over here I had to have like 20 planes or 25 or 30 planes shot down mm -hmm. on one mission. So it was a 10% overall they lost on every mission. Well, some groups lost none, some of them lost a lot. 10 men to a plane, and you lose six planes, 60 men. You lose 60 planes, there's 600 men that went down on one mission. Yeah. You know, so some of those early missions, they got the hell shot out of them, and at that time, they didn't have the, um, the Luftwaffe was flying and shooting a lot of them down because we didn't have any air support. Mm -hmm. Because our, our aircraft and the British aircraft didn't have the range to cover you all the way into a target like, like into Berlin or somewhere like that. 
it was too far for them. So you were up there with no air support whatsoever against fighter attacks. Mm -hmm. But when we got the P-51s in, the P-51s had a long range on them and they could go all the way to the target with you and help protect you. So we didn't get shot down so much by enemy aircraft as we did by the flak, because the flak kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier all the time. And did you encounter the Luftwaffe at all? Yes, but uh, only a few times, uh, fortunately, because I was there late enough in the war that those early guys are the ones that really got shot up. Mm -hmm. And I was there in mid-1944 from the guys from early 19... Uh, 19, from late 1943 up through 19, the middle of 1944, they got the hell shot out of them because they didn't have the long range protection. And what was your experience with them and your encounters with them? Well, um, like I say, the bombardier was the gunnery officer on board the plane too. And so when you would, somebody on the group would see the uh, enemy aircraft forming or getting ready to attack, they would radio all the rest of the group where they were and they'd be ready for them. So when they actually came in and attack, most of the Luftwaffe came in for head-on attacks. And so the bombardier had a good shot at them. And, but the ME-109s and those other things had 20 millimeter cannons. And we only had 50 caliber machine guns. They had longer range than we did, so they could sit there out of range and fire at us. And we couldn't fire back because they were out of our range. Mm -hmm. It was when they finished firing and they had to follow through that they came within our range and we could start shooting at them then and shoot them down. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, like anything else, but but you were mentally prepared for that. You expected that. And so when it happened, as I say, you were apprehensive, but you weren't terrified. But you're uh, sitting up in, in the, the front of the plane there. Yeah. Correct? The, the, originally, they didn't have the bomber, they didn't have that turret up in front for the bombardier to have a, a shot at them. Mm -hmm. They didn't have that there. And they were losing so many planes from these head on attacks that the later B 17s put a big turret up there with the machine gun so the bombardier, while he wasn't looking down on the bomb site, could look up and fire at the enemy planes and go back to his site again and uh, fire at the enemy uh, planes coming in. Mm -hmm. And that helped a lot too. Now did you fly all 30 missions with the same crew? No, I flew uh, about 10 missions with the one crew and then what they do when they when they make lead crews, they take the best pilots, the best bombardier, the best navigators off of these crews and put them all together in one lead plane, mm -hmm. and the other planes follow them and so forth. So what they did, they took me away from this one crew that I started out with and put me in with a different crew, a lead crew. Mm -hmm. So it was a different group that I ended up with. Mm -hmm. Now on any, on any of the missions, did any of your crew members get hit by flak? Yes, yes, we got two or three of them were wounded, a uh, couple of them pretty bad, but uh, um, we never had any of them actually die, but several of them were, were wounded, uh, and, uh, but we, we were lucky that we didn't, didn't have any actual deaths, and we were, we were able to get them back to the, uh, where uh, the ground could take over an air base, and, get them into a hospital. Can you talk about any of those experiences? Well... Because you, you said you were the on-flight medic, right? Yeah, well, what happened, unfortunately, what, what happened, like we had, like, well, there's one guy had uh, one leg that was almost shot off, uh, and he was a waste gunner, and, but it happened right on the bomb run, so I couldn't go back and do anything with him. The other bomb, the other, fortunately, we weren't really attacked by fighter aircraft at the time, and the other gunner could go over and try to staunch the blood and get it going there until I could get back there, put a tourniquet on it, and get him ready and keep the blood from going out, and uh, um, getting ready and keep him alive until we got back to the base. And the other two guys were just minor wounds. One of them got, got, got hit in the head and uh, uh, wasn't really that bad. And the other one got, another one got hit in the arm. 
Uh, well, we had two or three others that got hit, but not most of them got hit <laughs> and it would tear like your pants leg off or this sort of thing. Uh, and without actually doing much for a wound. Mm -hmm. And some of the couple of the guys got minor injuries, they just took care of it themselves. Mm -hmm. Now you were, earlier you mentioned a story uh, about you were, you were leaning forward at one point. Oh yeah. Yeah, can you tell me, tell me about that again? Oh, well that's what happened. Um, we were on the bomb run, there was a lot of flack, and I was bending over the bomb site like this, and somebody called fighters, you know, coming in. So I looked up and brought my got my uh, sighting for my guns there. So if they can't tack this head on, I'd be ready for them. And I was up there looking through the bomb site, looking for these fighter aircraft coming in on us. But I didn't see any at the time. And the flak was pretty heavy. So I put the gun sight over, swung it back out of the way so I could go back over to the site. Because when the gun sight is up there, you only have about that much room between the site and the bomb site. So you want to get it out of the way so you can bend over the site. So I swung it back over the way and bent over the site. Oh no, I hadn't, hadn't swung it out of the way, I remember this. I put it up there and I left it up there and I was bending over like this when the piece of flak came through and it blew right through that flak plexiglass nose, hit the bomb site, took the bomb site with it, and I'm out the other side. And I'm bending over like this, whoosh, like that. And um, so, well, and of course, well, wind started coming through the big hole. There was, had no plexiglass in the front there then, but uh, but it didn't. Uh, didn't, fortunately, I had been over just the right time to miss it, or it would have taken my head right with it out through the, the side. But uh, well, we finished the mission, no mm -hmm. problem. Very fortunate. Yeah. Um, did were there any instances where you guys had to uh, abort any missions or turn back early? We never had to, but there are other planes that did have to. Uh, if you were so badly, if you lost couple of engines, for example, and you couldn't keep up with the group. Mm -hmm. You just fall back. Unfortunately, you would become like a straggler, which was fair game for the enemy fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, but you would have to turn around and go back then. And um, but we never had. I know we never did have to abort a mission and go back. Mm -hmm. We lost one engine sometimes, and we actually lost two engines. Uh, but it was after during this. We were able to stay with the group. It wasn't on the way to the target. It was after we hit the target and came back. So we were able to stay pretty much with the group. And you had also mentioned earlier about, you know, as you guys are on a mission and, and you can see the other planes in formation, um, you'd see some planes get hit and they'd, yeah, they'd blow up. that's right. And you could see the parachutes coming out of some some no. <laughs> Does that affect you at all? No, as I say, you, you you expect those sorts of things. But you know, I mean, those are those are that's ten guys that are either gone. I they're mean, that gone. could very easily they're have gone. been they're you. Gone. That could very easily have been uh, you. Well, those the, there was a most of the crews they had a pretty good turnover in crews because you had new crews coming in and old crews that had finished your tour like we did when you flew thirty missions or originally 25 missions, you got to go back to the United States and um, preparing for whatever else they wanted to do with you. But those guys would be gone and a new crew would come in. And then if they got shot down, a new crew would come in. So there was this constant turning over of guys in the barracks. And the barracks would have about 50 guys in it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes after a mission, there were four empty bunks or eight empty beds, and then there were eight new guys come in. And or if somebody, if the guys finished a the mission, they were, their beds were, beds were empty, and new guys would come in. So there was this constant turnover. So you never got to be real good friends with any of them, except your own crew. Did you, did you lose any buddies over there? Um, no, because um, the ones that I knew well on my crew, we were all able to get back. Some of them wounded sometimes, but they were able to get back. And of course, these were the officers I'm talking about in the crew. You didn't 
fraternize much with the with the gunners and people like that, except on a mission itself. So you didn't get to be friends with them. Mm -hmm. um, officers were here, enlisted men were here. Um, so if a crew lost a lot of enlisted men over here, you didn't even know them, you know. So you didn't get, the only ones you really got to know were your own crew, because the other turnover was just yeah. so fast. Uh, so when you go on, to, when you would have a, a three-day pass or something, you went with your own crew. Now, what we did have, uh, they had a little village there, and if we were fogged in or something and couldn't uh, couldn't fly, some of the guys would take bicycles and ride into the village and go to the pubs and places. Mm -hmm. But being a good Mormon, I didn't do any drinking, so I didn't go to those pubs and places. Uh, I generally stayed around and uh, went to the officers' club or something and talked to some of the people there. But you never got to be very good friends of them because they weren't going to be around too long for one reason or another. Now tell me about uh, when he had to jump out of the, the plane. He said he jumped out of oh, the plane. Oh, that was it. We came back and one of our engines was on fire. And so when we landed with three engines, wasn't a big problem. But we were a little afraid about that fire now that the wind was blowing through the plane, uh, spreading and causing the fuel that was left in the plane to explode. So we all got out as fast as we could. Now, the, generally, if the, the, when you get in a plane, the crew gets into a side door on, uh, up behind the bomb bay where the two gunners are, and you walk through the plane, the pilots will go up to their place, and the navigator and the pilot bombardier will go through the door, up through the plane, down to a little next to the pilots, and down into the nose. But there was a nose hatch up here where you could go in and out. It was about mm, eight feet when the plane was parked on the ground, about eight feet high, and you could jump up and grab a hold of it and hoist yourself up and going that way if you wanted to. But you're wearing a flak suit and carrying a parachute, and we used to throw the parachutes. We had a chest pack parachute that hooked on two little things here so we could take it off. So we would throw the parachute up there and then go back and walk through the plane. And I always had to inspect everything anyway, the oxygen supply and the first aid kits and all that kind of stuff. So I rarely ever used that hatch. But this time, <laughs> we were getting out of the plane as fast as we could. So we opened the hatch, and, and myself and the navigator and the two pilots and the engineer up above them, we dropped out through the nose hatch. And so when I dropped, I just had to hit crooked on something down there and yeah. tore up my ligaments in my knee. But uh, after every mission, you reported back to an intelligence officer and told him about all the events of the mission. Um, and if you were wounded <laughs> at that time, they sent you to the hospital. But I didn't need my knee to do any flying or anything, so uh, I didn't want to be taken off that crew, so I didn't mention it. And it healed up. I was okay. So it was an engine that caught fire? Yeah, one of, one of the I didn't catch fire. I got hit by shack, by flak, and uh, caused it to ca catch on fire. And we flew back with what the, with the, with this one engine feathered, and everything. But it started a fire as we got back close to the base. What do you mean by feathered? Oh, the 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 propeller was stopped, hmm. and uh, usually the propellers like this. So to keep the wind off, so they they turn the propeller that way. So it's to reduce what they the call resistance. feathered. And so the wind would go by the propeller and it caused it. Weren't you on one that the wings fell off? When I what? Weren't you on one that the wings fell off? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was the one. They didn't fall off. They almost fell off. What happened? That was the one I told you about where we got flipped on their back. What caused it? When we pulled the plane out of that nose dive, it would put such a strain on the plane with all that gasoline in it and all those bombs that it caused the plane to buckle in the middle. And, but we flew the rest of the mission. But it also caused the wings 
<laughs> to tear the rivets and things all loose on the wings. So when we landed and at the plane, the plane just kind of fun fell apart in the middle and the two wings went clunk and hit the ground. <laughs> and the flight engineer, whose plane it was on the ground, he took care of on the ground, came over to us and he said, what have you done to my plane? <laughs> that was the end of that plane. They had to take it out of commission. <laughs> but it was, they didn't fall off, they just went clunk and hit the ground, you know. And the and the, the the thing buckled in the middle, and the the radio room had rivet heads all over the floor, everywhere on the. Wow. Not a lot of close calls. Yeah. Um, now you'd fly different planes. Each mission would would probably or possibly be a different plane. It would never be the same B seven. No, it was always the same plane, unless there was some reason for you not to have the same plane. Now, for example. The new crew usually got the older planes and they made them fly the lowest low, low in the squadron, which is the most dangerous place. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you moved up and sometimes you'd fly the same plane even, in ta even if you moved up. But generally the lead guys had to get planes that were very reliable because our rest of the crew was following them and doing what they did. And if you lost your lead planes, the other crews, although they have been, they have been briefed on what to do and everything, they, they really didn't have a leader. And um, so you tried to get the good planes and the best ones and the best crews and everything on those leads. And did you guys name the, the plane? That you flew on? They named all of them. I think the one that we, I flew on most was called Ragged But Right. <laughs> what was it called? Ragged but right. Oh, ragged but right. But well, we changed it later on to rugged but right. <laughs> <laughs> but originally when we got it, somebody named it ragged but right, and we changed it to rugged but right. <laughs> Just got to put a little paint on that, yeah, eh? Yeah, right. And the guys, when they get a new plane, a new, new uh, a plane would come in, they would put a pretty girl on the nose or give it a name or this sort of thing. And in the mess hall, they had big plaques all over the walls and everything with all the planes and names on them all over there. And was it the pilot who would who'd choose the name or? Oh, it was a kind of a consensus. People would say different names and they would all agree on the name. The so the crew would come up Yeah, with we never knew who would actually suggested what. <laughs> and then some usually, by the time when you first got there, the older planes already were named and already had bombs painted on how many missions had flown and everything. Mm -hmm. You you felt a little odd when you got up, you first arrived there and they gave you a plane with like 37 bombs on it and already flown 37 missions. And you think, why couldn't I get a new plane? <laughs> I don't want this old one. It's had pretty good luck if it yeah, survived all exactly. 37. And you thought, well, maybe that block will hold out. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned earlier that you received the Silver Star. Oh, yeah. What did, what did you receive that for? Well, I received that for a mission. I was one of the leads on the mission. Well, as a matter of fact, it was on the lead where I was leading and it blew the, the bomb side of the the gun out of the side of the plane. I got the silver star for that because I kept on with the mission, although that had been blown, blown out. They said, you know, mm -hmm. you would have had a, a good excuse to turn it over to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But um, that's what I got that for. And what about the the DFC, the distinguished oh, flying they, cross? Oh, that's kind of automatic. If you survive so many missions, you got a distinguished flying cross. And and they didn't give them to all the crew, but to the lead crews, if you flew so many missions and had certain percentage of accuracy and everything, you got the DFC. Mm -hmm. And you got automatically, if you survive four missions, you got um, an air medal. Mm -hmm. And if you flew four more, you got a little um, uh, uh, wreath to put on that air medal. So I had an air medal with four wreaths on it because I flew 30 missions. Mm -hmm. now, are there any other uh, missions or, or instances that, that we haven't touched on yet? That 
Um, none that I can think of. The rest of them were pretty, you know, really ordinary. We went through and did the mission the way it was supposed to go yeah. and managed to come back. And we came back many times with, with a lot of holes in the plane, but were never actually shot down. And um, so we got back okay. Mm -hmm. And as I say, the planes got shot up, but that was pretty much on every mission. And you just got used to those holes in the plane, um, but those were those were the only ones where I was in really in in that much danger. Mm -hmm. um, so you guys are flying. Some of these missions are eight eight hours. Oh yeah, we would fly when you fly to uh, well when you're flying to Berlin, for example, it was like a ten hour mission because. It took you, the mission itself was only like like seven, six, seven, maybe eight hours. Mm -hmm. But that assembly mm -hmm. took about at least an hour, an hour to an hour and a half. And that's counted as part of the mission. So you fly a 10 hour mission and you're maybe really only eight hours on your way there over the target and back. But then when you land, you also have to land in, in order, and you're flying around your own airfield there, way if you turn to land. So that's considered part of the mission. And how much of that time are you, like, once you reach the, you know, the IP and, and yeah. once you encounter, the, you know, the flak, right. how long does that flak last for until you, you know, you're, you're dropping the bombs and you guys are out of there? But generally speaking, it depends on if it was a big mission like Kinamundi or, or uh, uh, Merseburg or Berlin, uh, all the way from the initial point, you got flak. It wasn't as much as it was centered over the target, but you got flak shooting at you all the way in. Um, <clears throat> and they would track you and fire at you, but uh, over, the, over the target itself, they would buy this box yeah. of flak you had to fly through. Um, and after the mission, flying back, you also got guys on the ground shooting at you because you had to fly over a lot of these places where they had. I remember one time we were flying in, I think we were flying to Pila Mundi, which was north of Berlin. So we came in over to the Baltic Sea. And as we came in over the Baltic Sea, they had flat guns on barges down there. And as we came in, those barges would take you in and aim at it, and every group that went by, bang, 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 they were firing at them. And they shot down several planes before they ever got to the mission. And that was true all the way across Germany. They had these flat guns all the way wherever you went. Mm -hmm. And the, before you went, and when they plotted your course to the mission, these intelligence people, uh, knew where the flat guns were, and they would plot the mission, the course of the mission, never went just straight. It was always like, kind of, kind of like this, as you're trying to miss those areas where they have a lot of flat guns yeah. and you knew about, like big cities where usually had a lot of flat guns around them and that sort of thing. So, but does all, that the last way, so all the way in and all the way back, you were also getting shot at, but mm -hmm. just not with that huge barrage. That much concentration. Right. But is that, is that like a matter of minutes? When we're talking about like the heavy concentration of... Oh yeah, you might be generally uh, heavy concentration was yeah, a matter of minutes because usually uh, uh, I would say depending on how long the, the, the bomb run was, it would be between 10 and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you were in, in that heavy barrage. And how many, how many bombs are you guys carrying? Well, it depends on what your kind of bomb you were carrying. You would carry carry like um, if there were a thousand pounders, you could carry like one, two, three, four, five, ten of them. If they were a mixture of thousand pounders and six hundred pounders, you could carry more. You know, it was a weight, and the weight was uh, something like uh, six thousand pounds. I think you could carry in bombs. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a mixture. Whatever the target was, they selected the bombs, whether some of them were incendiary or what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when you guys are flying, are you guys talking to each other 
through throughout the flight. You know, to pass yeah, time we have, and... we have, uh, well, not only that, we didn't talk much on the flight itself. What happened, the uh, bombardier was an oxygen officer <laughs> also, and every five, five minutes you had to call, you would know, get on the intercom to the crew, and you would say, oxygen check. And then Bob and, and then tail gunner would say, tail gunner, okay. Then, Left right uh, waist gunner, okay. Right waist gunner, okay. Uh, engineer, okay. Left pilot, pilot, co pilot, okay. Pilot, okay. Navigator, okay. Okay, and then the bombardier, okay. And then five minutes later, oxygen check, okay. Tail gunner, okay. So forth. So all the way there and all the way back until you got down to where you didn't need oxygen anymore. The navigator, the bombardier had to do the oxygen checks. And if a guy didn't answer, because sometimes he would accidentally knock loose his oxygen and didn't notice it, mm -hmm. you know, pull it loose or something like that, and at the time didn't notice it and would pass out without, before he even knew what happened. Mm -hmm. And so he'd say, you know, tail gunner, okay, left way, no, no answer from the engineer. And you'd say, hey, radio operator, check the engineer, which was right close to him, and see what's happening there. So he would look and say, oh my God, he's unconscious, you know. So then they would go back and plug him back in, get him back conscious. So you'd have we to, never uh, lost anybody. But, uh -huh. but that that happened a few times? Or? Well, yeah. Uh, well, for example, when we flew upside down, when that plane flew upside down, almost everybody's oxygen was pulled loose. Mm -hmm. And we had to go back, and I had to go back and... And not only get the bombs back on the racks and get everything safe squared away there, but I had to make sure everybody was still alive, you know, because it took me um, about 10 minutes or so or 15 minutes to get those bombs back where they would be safe. I couldn't get them all back right on the rock, the racks themselves, but enough because a 500 pound bomb, you can't <laughs> lift it. And I, but I got them all safety. So when they went out, they would explode on the way out. Um, but I had to make sure then to go back and check and make sure all the guys had replugged their oxygen in. So, th so that got a bit repetitive, I would imagine. Yeah, I got do it ninety, a hundred times a mission. Exactly, it was a, a big chore. Uh -huh. But it had to be done. Yeah. And the guys that didn't do it, they did lose people. You know, so they they would caution us all the time. You know, make your oxygen checks, make your oxygen checks. Yeah. And if you didn't do it, the pilot would call down and say, "Hey, what well, I'm talking you doing? Get your oxygen check going." You know, so yeah. you're okay, you start going it again. So now tell me, is there is there a bathroom on board? No, um, we usually took an old ammunition tin can. <laughs> can which was about that big like that and put it down there mm -hmm. and if you had to go you went, went in that mm -hmm. and it was all frozen <laughs> so it didn't make any order or anything but uh, there was nothing no bathrooms on the board at all but you're but you're saying too it's like negative 30 40 That's 50 right. degrees up you, there so. you you try not to uh, do a lot of drinking of water and everything one nice thing about a mission you always took a sack of cookies with you that they gave us when we, when we left the mess hall. Uh, they would give you a sack full of cookies. And at the end of a mission, when you got down to the point where you didn't have to have oxygen mask, we would break out the cookies and pass them out to the crew. Everybody would get some cup of cookies. Because you'd been like, like eight or nine hours sometime before. And breakfast was like 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And here it is, 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening, you're coming back. So you uh, probably didn't eat. a long time, there's nothing to eat. Yeah. So we had a bag of cookies. Mm. Now, would you ever doze off or, or you know, sort of get no. lulled into a... No, well, not only that, you were almost always up to the point where you couldn't afford to doze off. You had to get that oxygen. If you dozed off and you didn't answer the oxygen check, even though you were getting oxygen and you didn't answer, you know, you tell the, one of the guys nearby, go over and give that guy a kick. Yeah, so those exercises <laughs> were probably a way of keeping you guys yeah, focused as well. Right. and as well, right. as well, you were always 
there was always a certain amount of anxiety anyway right. because you were always looking for fighter pilots for uh, to come in and they would attack the column at different places so you never knew so you always had to be alert for uh, aircraft coming in mm -hmm. i remember on one mission there were six aircraft coming in at us and my gunners were saying, shall we shoot, shall we shoot? And I thought to myself, they're coming at us head on. And I head on, um, and any 109 looks just exactly like a P-51. You can't see the wings that are different because you're just looking at them head on. So I thought, we're not in a fighter area. There hasn't been any fighters reported here. I better not, and so I told them, hold your fire, hold your fire to all the guys on there. And um, so they did. They held their fire and held them. And they were saying, shall we shoot? Shall we shoot? And they, no, no, no. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I hope I'm not wrong. But sure enough, they came in and swung around us. And when they did, flew up close to us. One of them on the side of us I had the word Ohio baby written on it. <laughs> they were P 51s. They were you know? friendly. And, and I thought to myself, oh, those idiots. What are they doing flying hell on toward a group of of uh, bombing, you know, yeah. where they know they look like FIFA, like uh, ME 109s. Uh, they very easily could have been. Could shot. very easily have started shooting at them. Might have shoot, I shot some of them down. Yeah. But, uh, well, you know, these were a bunch of kids. You got to realize your kids like 18, 19, 20 years old. That's the age of most of them. And you didn't have a bunch of 40-year-old guys up there, 45-year-olds with a lot of brain and a lot of intelligence. And with age might come wisdom, but you take a 19-year-old kid or 18-year-old kid with a 50 caliber machine gun up there, you don't expect him to be a, a big wizard. Yeah. Do you remember the last mission that you flew? No, I don't. I don't remember where it was. It wasn't a bad one, I remember, but I don't remember where it was. But do you remember uh, the day leading up to it? Because it, it essentially was your last mission, and, and you yeah, must have had some... I remember at the end of when we came back down, uh, we had a, a, a photographer from a local newspaper who came and took our picture. Mm -hmm. and uh, Was it a, other people's final mission as well? I don't remember anybody else at that time actually left at the same time we did mm -hmm. because they kind of come and go, come and go, come yeah. and go. And I don't think any of them ended the same day we did. And fortunately, I remember it wasn't a bad mission. It was a kind of a milkroom that was well after uh, 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 D-Day. And so you didn't have so much flack going in and coming out because by that time the Allies had taken a lot of the places that used to be big flak areas. But over the targets themselves, you know, they had still had the flak, mm -hmm. but not too much going and coming. Yeah. Uh, was there any sense of relief or jubilation once, once you... Uh... No, no, it was just, this is part of the deal. <laughs> Yeah, we were all happy to be alive and well. Did you know but, you were going uh, home? Oh yeah, but we also knew we were going to be training to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, that time, the war in Japan was really, really going. And um, so we knew it was going to be just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than where we were leaving. Mm -hmm. So it turned out, fortunately, the war ended there before I actually had to go over. So when I heard they dropped the atomic bomb over there and it was over, I thought, thank God, you know, as well as all the other guys felt the same, you know, because we knew that if we had to invade Japan, there were going to be a lot of them would not come back. Yeah. And when did you make it back to the States? Uh, that was in uh, February of uh, 1945. Um, no, it was in March of 1945, because I remember the war ended in May, two months later. Did it, at the time, did it feel like the war was coming to an end? Yeah, we were, uh, they were, they were knocking on, um, on Berlin's uh, borders at that time. And not only that, but the Russians were coming in from the, from the, the east. east. And um, so you could see that the handwriting was on the wall. And after the Battle of the Bulge, which was at Christmas time, 1944, 
they knew the war was pretty well won by that time because that was their big, last big push. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a matter of time how long they were going to hold out. But the flak was just as heavy and just as thick as it had been before. They were still shooting like crazy. How did you feel once you got back, back home? Well, the anxiety was gone, you might say. Other than that, it was just another training time. You know, training um, different airplanes and different things to get it ready to go to uh, to Japan. Mm -hmm. So, as I say, except for the anxiety, the rest of it was pretty much the same. Still so, wore the uniform. You still had inspections. You still had to march. More all of the same. types of things. Um, and then, what about when once the war had finally ended? Well, then it was a kind of rigmarole of trying to get all these guys discharged. And you had to wait for a certain length of time until your time, your, they could get around to you. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I was in Texas, and I had to go first to San Diego, where I was three or four days there waiting, then I went back up to Santa Ana, and I was there for a week or so while they get ready. Then it was over to Fort MacArthur for two or three days, and I finally got us there, and finally we were able to go home. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just jumping from one place to the other. Uh, they just had too many guys to deal with. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you stayed in the reserves for a number yeah. of years. So when when were you well, relieved what, of active duty? Well, what happened is. Um, I was in the Air Force at, uh, when I came out and was discharged, and I was then I got involved in, in motion pictures and this sort of thing, and I actually went to work for the Army for a while. They had a motion picture division here in Hollywood that were doing training films or films about. Remember when they were doing the atomic tests in the South Pacific? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk and some of those other places there. Uh, this big group of motion picture people were documenting all those things, and all that footage was coming back here to Hollywood. And not only that, they were doing training films and things of that nature. Uh, so I got a job with them, and I was just a civilian employee, but writing scripts and going around, and I did some work for writing scripts about the tests in the South Pacific and so forth. So. When I, then I found out I could go into reserve and get to be a motion picture officer and do the same work I was doing as a civilian, but two weeks a year and a lot of different training manuals and things I had to work on. Uh, but I decided to go into the reserve then as long as I could go in as a motion picture officer mm -hmm. and not as a flying officer. So that's what I did and I was in the reserve for over 30 years, but I was always doing documentary films and training films and things like that for the Army. And you Never did do any more combat flying. Yeah. It was okay with me. You did your fair share. But I did get to do some flying because, for example, one time I was uh, got a job with the Army and they didn't have a training film for uh, some new uh, instrumentation they had put on an F-4 uh, and uh, they had one of the things was a new uh, uh, gyroscope, uh, the old gyroscopes where they did violent maneuvers, they would tumble and they had a new gyroscope in, in there and the, that uh, they would hold its position. Uh, so they wanted to do a training film to teach the new crews about how to handle the new uh, instrumentation. And that was up at Lemoore Naval Air Station up here where they had F-4s. So I got a job and to go up and uh, uh, do a training film for them up there. So when I got up there, they knew, uh, they told them I had been in the Air Force, so they assumed I'd been a pilot. Mm -hmm. And I didn't tell them I had been a bomber here, but they assumed I'd been a pilot. But anyway, I got ready to go up and I had to take a ride in an F-4. And which were two place things, and they said they were going to show me how this thing worked in during maneuvers. 
So I got in this F4, and one of the things they did, we had to have what they call was the G suit. And you pull so many Gs in some of these maneuvers that it would, uh, it would squeeze you, that, that your ground, the blood would rush out of your head with the G-forces and pull it down so guys were passing out. So they had invented a G-suit that went around your waist like this. And when they pulled a lot of Gs, it would squeeze you like this, and would keep the blood up in your head so you didn't pass out. Well, I had one of the G-suits. So when we went up there, and the guy said, okay, watch the gyroscope. I'm gonna do a loop and watch what happens when we come down. Okay, so I'm watching this gyroscope, and we went down. You know, this was a jet plane, one of the big new jets. And it came up and came down, and we pulled, pulled so many Gs that the G chute went like that to my waist, went, and I'd forgotten I was wearing this thing, and I thought, what the hell is that? Went, oh my God, I'm coming apart. <laughs> and the pilot pulled out and he said, well, did you see that? I said, see what? <laughs> he said, did you see the gyroscope? It didn't tumble. I said, I forgot to look. <laughs> he said, we'll do it again. No. <laughs> I mean, this time I was ready and I was watching it. So then he did some slow rolls and he did snap rolls. He did some more loops and some twists. And I thought, is this all necessary? <laughs> <laughs> and by this time, when we finally came in and landed, there were about 10 of these young pilots there. And they said, because I was in my 50s at that time, mm -hmm. and they said to this pilot, did he get sick? Did he get sick? <laughs> they were and I thought, to... you son of a bitch. <laughs> you were trying to get me sick. We didn't have to go through all those things. <laughs> and he said, no, he didn't get sick. And I didn't tell them that I never got sick in the air. It didn't matter what they did, what they did. I never once I got sick in the air. You'd already and been upside down before. I would have been upside down and down, all that stuff before. <laughs> didn't they let you fly a plane one time too? Fly on something? They let you fly one. Oh yeah, this guy, when we were up there, I forgot to tell you. When we got there, we finally went through all these things. He said, would you like to fly it? Well, he thought I'd been a pilot. Well, I'd had some pilot training. So I said, yeah. So he told me, hey, you got it. I took over and I'm flying pretty straight and level. I did a few gentle turns and things, but it was easier to fly than uh, most of the propeller-driven planes because a jet has no torque to it. You don't have that big propeller out there driving away. Mm -hmm. That's one thing about flying, uh, Planes like a P-51, they lost a lot of them on the ground and the pilots, when they give it full power to take off, that torque was so heavy that would turn those P-51s and make them go sideways mm -hmm. unless you were ready for it. And they lost some guys doing that. But anyway, but a jet doesn't have any torque like that. So this was easy to fly and I got to fly it. But as I say, I'd fly on a B-17 and some other training planes. I got some pictures of me somewhere with the, the training planes and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And you mentioned so, you did you did a lot of writing in your career. Yeah, yeah. Afterwards. Well, that's why I say this was this wasn't an Air Force job. Right. This was uh, when I was in the reserve. This was one of my freelancing, and I was fly, writing things for the Navy and for the Air Force and for the Army and for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and. Wherever I could make a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. So tell me about some of the writing that that you've done. Oh, well, I've written fifteen novels now, mm -hmm. and don't ask me how many you're selling, <laughs> but they're out there with Amazon. And uh, I've had uh, one of the things I did when I came back from the war on the GI Bill. I went to school and studied music. Went to a place called the the Wesley College of Music, and because I always liked music. So now, in the last few years, I've been writing, and I went to the Pasadena Playhouse too. I started writing some stage plays. So I've written, I've had four stage plays off Broadway, and um, and I've had three musicals. One, one on of Broadway. them is the World War II. Pardon? One of them is the World War II one, the Flack House one. That's right, and they're getting ready to bring it back this fall. Um, it's called Flack House. One of the things, and um, 
after so many missions, you get to go to what they call a rest home. They don't want you to get combat fatigue. Mm -hmm. So they had taken to the Air Force in England, had taken some of these old English manor houses that had been donated to them <coughs> and turned them into rest homes where a crew of usually uh, <laughs> enlisted men went to one place and the officers went to another. So your crew of officers would go to this rest home and stay up there for like a week or ten days. And you wear civilian clothes, you you played baseball and loafed around and didn't do anything and singing and, and it was run by the Red Cross, so the Red Cross girls would join in dancing with you. And um, so we were up there for a week or ten days and then you were back to combat again. You know you're going back into combat. So, but they, it seemed to help with the combat fatigue. So I thought, what a great setting for a musical. So I did, I wrote this musical here about two years ago, mm -hmm. and it ran off Broadway for um, about a, almost a year. Then the producer took all the money that we were making and I was with it <laughs> and went to South America or somewhere, we don't know where. So the show had to close because they had no more money and the theater owner would expect to be paid, of course, and the cast expected to be paid. So we had to close it up. But I've got a new producer now who wants to bring it back this fall. And then I've got another one he also wants to do that they've been off Broadway for almost a year and he wants to bring it back. Then I've got a new one I'm working on now that he wants to do. Um, hopefully this fall. Then I've got a Christmas musical I'm working on. And when I write these things, I write the book and I write the lyrics and I write the music. So I've got, had, uh, they say, four straight plays and, and three musicals already produced on, on Broadway and I've got three more coming up soon, um, keeping my fingers crossed. Plus I've got those 15 novels plus over 500 documentaries. Um, and I've got, oh, I forgot to tell you, here about, oh, I guess, I'd written some uh, screenplays for feature films and nothing came up and the guys, every one of them all fell apart before they get going. But one of them, about 10 years ago, was all set to go before they couldn't get the money and it fell apart. But he called me about, three months ago, four months ago, and said, is that screenplay still available? And I said, yeah. So he said, I got a new group of producers, we want to produce it. So I said, okay, so they've taken it and that's in the works now. In the meantime, my wife, Frances, was considered at one time the, the best Western screenwriter in Hollywood. She wrote over 30 different uh, um, movie screenplays, for all for Westerns. And she was the only woman screenwriter for Westerns at one time, but there were others, but she was the premier screenwriter. And this was before I met her. And after I met her and we were married, the B movie uh, Western market fell apart. And they stopped making these B movies. So she and I collaborated on two or three screenplays for television, like, uh, like Zorro and those sorts of things. Uh, and then she started going back to college and gave up writing altogether. And I was really working and crazy at writing at that time. But anyway, this guy called me and he said, is that screenplay still available? I said, yeah. So he's, it's in the works now. In the meantime, another producer called me up and said, who I'd been going to do some work with and again it fell apart, but he said, hey, we want to do a movie about your wife. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, she was the most notable screenwriter, woman screenwriter in Hollywood at one time. And nobody else had written 30 Westerns and we wanted to do a movie about her. Would you mind working with her on it? So I did. And they've got a screenplay out there now that this producer, they're doing a series of movies. And this one about Francis is going to be the third one in this series. And, um, they said they're supposed to get started on that now and sometime this fall. I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that. 
And in the meantime, another producer who I've been going to do some work with, an English lord of all things in England, had wanted to do some of my movies, and they fell apart. He called me here about two weeks ago and said, hey, is that one script still available? And I said, yeah. And he said, I've got a people here in Spain. He's living in Spain now. He said, we want to do it and shoot it down here in Spain. So I emailed him a copy of the script. That was two weeks ago. Hoping for the rest on that. But these things, you know, they fall apart at the last minute. And so I've got those three movies that works right now. And um, plus uh, these these plays and these movies and other musicals in New York. And um, got a couple of novels, more novels that I'm doing some work on. I got an idea for a, another musical, a Christmas musical I want to work on. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I still got a lot of things going. Uh, so well, that's, I, that's why I keep an that. office, because I know if I don't go into an office, I won't do it. Yeah. But I get up in the morning, I go to the office, and I stay there until 6 o'clock or so at night, bring things home with me, I can work on here. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I don't go to an office, I won't do it. <laughs> now let me ask you how, do you, how do you feel that your time in the service shaped you as, as a man and, um, you know, sort of... Well, set you up for the rest of your life. I don't know what I would have been without it. Uh, for example, I was working as a tool and die maker and machinist before I went to the service. I, it's problematical. Would I have gotten sick and tired of being a machinist and gone into some form of show business anyway? Um, I have no way of knowing. All I know is when I came out, and had an opportunity to go to college and an opportunity to do something else, I thought, I don't want to be a machinist all my life. <laughs> and I certainly don't want to be a farmer. That being a farmer in, you see, from the time we were living in Idaho, when I was a kid, I was working on those farms from the time I was about, oh, I guess 11 years old until I was, uh, 14 or 15 when we came back to California and I hated it. I hate that farm work. I remember one time, I don't know if I ever told you this story, Robbie Jane, I was, one of the farmers up there had been, a, used to run with a hole in the wall gang when he was young, you know, up in uh, Montana. But now he was a farmer and he had to bring his hay in so he hired me uh, to come and help him bring his hay in. I remember I was about, I guess I was about 12 years old. So I went over there and the first day we worked all morning and he fixed lunch for us. We went and had lunch in his little log cabin and he cooked the lunch and I was eating there and he was at the stove and he said, would you like some more? I wasn't particularly fond of his cooking. So I said, no, I'm okay. He took a butcher knife and threw it across the wall about as far from me to Robbie Jane there, and it stuck on the wall right next to my ear, boing! <laughs> and I went, oh my God! And he said, you sure you don't want any more of my cooking? And I said, yes, yes! <laughs> I ate all the things, whatever he cooked, from then on was okay with me. <laughs> and I remember that night when my father came to pick me up to take me home. He and that guy were out in front laughing, and I thought, I bet they're laughing at that when he threw the knife at me. I didn't think it was funny. <laughs> but anyway, that was just one of the things that convinced me I never wanted to be a farmer. Now, last question I have for you. Um, if you had any advice for my generation or future generations, well, what would yes that be? and no. Today, there are so many opportunities for people to do things out there. So many roads you can take. When I was when I was young and growing up, uh, you were pretty well socked into what your generation, not only generation did, but, but what your parents did and your grandparents and your parents before them. If they were farmers, you were a farmer. If they were machinists, you were a machinist. If they ran a, a store, you ran a store. Today, you've got all these tremendous opportunities out there for you. 
And I think that's the really big difference between what it was then and what it is now. You can go and you can be anything you want. And even women are getting to the point where they can do and be anything they want to be. And I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah.